Revolution. Yeah, buckle up. World Revolution. It's a world revolution. Yeah, buckle up. Tune in to the low revolution. My dick is tatted. All right, let's get to it. What is up, guys? My name is Poncho Moller. Welcome to another episode of Lil Revolution. This is my buddy Wee Man here. Today we got a very special guest. She is an actress, entrepreneur, stand-up comedian, also a writer of a new book that just came out called Why Are You So Sensitive? Let's welcome Billy Lee. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Billy. Thanks there for having go. me. <laughs> Poncho, you should read that book. I did. <laughs> I, did? I, I read like a uh, probably like 25 pages of it last night. Why are you of. sensitive? Is that what people say? <laughs> yeah. No, no. I read, I, I just read it just kind of to get to know you a little bit more and a little bit about you. Yeah. You know, I've, I've only seen you do in, in stand up. That's kind of how I saw you. I saw you at one of his shows, the Where bourbon room shows. I don't, I don't think I was, Who I think I him? showed up earlier. Who's him for the audience? Kita, <laughs> our producer. <laughs> yeah. For now. Yeah. And, um, that's kind of how I saw you, and then that's kind of how I got interested in your story. And you know, where I'm always interested in co co comedians that are different, mm -hmm. like particularly myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was at the the improv the other day when you were yeah. there, and I kind of introduced. But that's like 150 comics. It's dark. I know, crazy. <laughs> and I was and in, in reading your book, the microaggression and stuff, because I never really just kind of me and this dude come from a different world where it's it's I don't know, it's a little bit. Like we're professional skateboarders, and mm -hmm. it's just, it's a very macho attitude, broy attitude, and like I would get stuff like, "Man, like you are really good for a midget," you know, like or like things like that. That like it's like a backhanded compliment totally. where you're like, "What the?" F I'm like, "Is that like a compliment or w what is that?" Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you ever got stuff like that, like, but like well, it, it's in a while. But I think it's the person who says it. Oh yeah, it's their arrogance that you have to understand and yeah. you gotta realize. And it was always like friends of other people that like they they they're like, you gotta skate with my buddy Poncho. And then that that's kind of how it worked. But like even when we were at the improv the other day, I don't know if you uh, you I saw you at the end. So I don't know if you stayed in the room the whole time. I didn't but oh, okay. But there was like this black dude that went up and his whole and he was really tall. And his whole thing was about like and he bombed really, really hard. But his whole thing was about like being bullied by a midget. Being bullied by a midget. I was bullied by a midget. And then the, the the punchline at the end was like, and what's crazy is I saw him five years later at the beach. And have you ever seen a midget swim? It's like they're trying to survive. And I was like thinking, I'm like, dude, you don't even swim. But like, you know, that's the, what, but I, I kind of, it's, it's cringing to watch mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So as a trans woman, how is it for you, like, in that joke world? Because I feel like I'm a target all the time. Totally. But I can take it, you know? But, like, for you, like, yeah. in the microaggression stuff, like. I hear it all the time, too. Like, I think I went, I was meeting a friend of mine, Allie, who books at the improv. And she was like, come meet me, hang out. Sorry, hold on one second. Do you need water or something? <clears throat> I'm okay. I just, like, was around Sammy yesterday, and she smokes weed. Mm. <laughs> Sam, Sammy Weiser, she's yeah. great. She's a great comic. She's my bestie, and we work together. But um, literally every time I leave her place the next day, I sound like <laughs> I am choking on something all day because she's just smoking yeah. around me nonstop. Hold my breath <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. so much she's heavy, like, heavy smoker, huh? When we did our podcast the next day, I'd always feel like I'm sick, and I'm like, "What is up with our podcast? Why do I always feel sick after recording?" Her smoking in this small little studio. She's not smoking in this one. Um, <laughs> but uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I got it a lot. Like, I remember the other day I was going to the improv and I literally walked in and there was like two guys, two comedians, like already talking shit about trans people. And mm. I was just like, oh God, here we go. Such a bro -y, like, I don't know, a lot of comics are like that. But um, I, I remember I went on a, I didn't, it wasn't a date, but I met this guy on Raya. Mm hmm. And I was it literally on my Raya, it says just for friends. Like, I do not want to date you. It's just for friends. I was in New York. I wanted to hang out with other comics. So there was like this comic who's pretty well known was like, you know, we were talking to each other and he's like, let's meet up at the New York Comedy Club. I'm like, yeah, cool. 
it says trans on my profile. As soon as I meet him, he was like, immediately I could tell he didn't know that I was trans. He was mm. like, wow, your voice is like raspier than I imagined. I'm like, oh, great. He what? doesn't know. And then, <laughs> oh, and then we're like hanging out and he goes up because he's performing that night and he like is transphobic. Like his jokes are transphobic. And I'm like, oh my God. And then later he DM'd me and was like, I'm so sorry. I didn't know you were trans because obviously I left. And then he blocked me, which was weird. But I get it like all the time, especially yeah. from comics. But like, yeah, it's a thing. And I think like it's just for me, whenever you make fun of someone who is a minority or who is like just also beaten down by society, it's just like it's so weak to me as a comedian I a lot of times yeah. I, I see them bomb. I'm just like, can you be a little bit more creative? I don't ever know, like, honestly, because, like, the comedy world is such a kind of, like, I feel like I, I stand alone. Like, everyone's alone. They're, 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 like, they're their own warrior up there, you know? And I don't know necessarily if he bombed because, because I was in the room and people mm -hmm. felt uncomfortable to laugh and there's friends that I have. But I, 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 I say the word midget. I, I use it like it's. I, I, I empower it and I don't know if people feel like that makes it okay for them to like just go off. Like I don't really care. Like if you have a good short joke, do it, dude. Mm -hmm. Like if it like another person did like a whole thing and it was great. It wasn't uncomfortable. It was so funny. But this guy just did that. And necessarily I don't know if people didn't laugh because I was in the room. Or because it just wasn't funny. Sometimes I don't know, and I don't know how to gauge that. Yeah. So I don't want to. I don't want to do that to a comic, but I also I'm like, dude, you should kind of like just write better jokes. Like to yeah. be honest. No, I agree, yeah. and like it's like, I don't. You said he was a tall black guy. Yeah. But like, I would never go up and make jokes about a black person. Like, I just for me personally, I make jokes about myself. Yeah. And because that's what I know, and that's what I'm comfortable with. And I think it's cool to make fun of your own experience yeah. because like, why oh, absolutely. not laugh at it, you know, yeah. especially if you go through a lot with society and discrimination. It's like, now that I have started comedy, it feels so good to just have fun with myself mm -hmm. and not be so um, sensitive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, in, in your book, like there was like different anecdotes from like different people and like different like groups that were whoever wrote the antidote was representing that group and like the microaggressions that they feel like one person was talking about like being black, but also like being half black, half white. And then like, but he looks more white. So when he hangs out with like white people that don't know that he, he hears a lot of like really racial shit mm -hmm. and he's got to be like, dude, I'm black. Like, you know, like, and sometimes they don't care. Or sometimes they're like, Oh, we're sorry. You know, like, but, I was like, damn, that's kind of, I never really kind of like thought of that until kind of I, I started reading about that. So yeah, thank you for no, that. Of course. Yeah. I think that we all come with like certain privileges. And even for me, I am like what they call cis assuming. So people assume that I'm cis okay. um, because I've had the privilege to have all these surgeries and really express my feminine energy. But I've been in, in situations where people didn't know that I was trans and they would talk really negative about trans people. Yeah. Um, and it just, uh, it, it just hurts in a way, um, which is also one reason why I decided I need to like own who I am and be open and proud about that just so I can, yeah. you know, be there and stand up and be, um, visible for my community. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about, um, I wanted to ask, cause you, you said in a joke the other day about why surgery in Vietnam? Like why Vietnam? Mm. Like I, I, when I think Vietnam, I just think of like a third world country. I'm like, I don't know. I didn't know they had like these high tech doctors. There oh, you mean or Thailand? Or, or Thailand? Yeah. <laughs> Thailand. Yeah. Okay. So both of them. Yeah. I, I thought you said Vietnam. Maybe I heard it wrong. I'm, I'm fucking dumb. No, but, no, like, no. It's definitely <laughs> Thailand. Yeah. Um, I'll never forget where I got my vagina. But, yes. Um, <laughs> she uh, had a, me a menu for it too. Yeah. <laughs> so she got to go down and pick the one. Oh. Yeah. I saw. That's pretty cool. Well, you like oh really? You, you, you <laughs> look at photos. I did my homework. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you look Good at photos <laughs> of of like you know you like to, if you're gonna go to any plastic surgeon, mm. it doesn't matter what you're getting done. You're gonna look at their work, um, and so you want to pick the best, what looks the best. And then I interviewed some people who 
went to that same doctor and they had a wonderful experience. And in Thailand, it's like five star treatment. Like they mm. literally are constantly taking care of you. Like my first four days, I was bedridden, like in the, the hospital, and my nurse slept on the floor, like on a yoga mat mm. next to me, just to make sure if I needed anything. And then I was transferred from the hospital to a five star resort and I was healing. And like it was just such a beautiful experience. I felt very safe the entire time what is that what is that like the healing process for a procedure Mm -hmm. like that um it's usually like anywhere from like a month to three months okay uh you know you don't walk for like a good seven days like normal surgery Mm -hmm. do they take they take the actual penis skin Uh and reshape it right and invert it the other way yeah yeah they take everything yeah um, like, I, I guess there's like two different ways you can do it, but I don't know the way that I was, my doctor did it. And the way that most doctors do it in Thailand is they recycle everything mm-hmm. pretty much. Mm. Cause you want all the nerves so you can have a really good yeah. orgasm. So you get the that was one of going to be, cause I, I was kind of, I'm like, if you cut the nerves and stuff, like, do they rejuvenate or are you able to have an orgasm? I have a way better orgasm. Really? Mm-hmm. And, um. This is this might be a little too personal, but after the recovery, how long does it take before you can try it out and and see if it's if it's like what everything you wanted, you know? Yeah, that's scary because it's like you're re, you're discovering something new. Um, so I was definitely really scared, uh, and your nerves are healing. I don't know if you've ever had any nerves heal, but like yeah. they kind of like do these weird little things as they're healing, and so like I would literally just be like sitting down and being like, oh my God, am I having an orgasm right now? Like, (laughs) oh wow. Because they're healing, you know, like there's things happening down there and I wasn't even touching myself. So it was definitely intense at times. Um, And yeah, it was just, it was just kind of scary. I don't know. I guess it was like, I guess when you're younger, you know, and you like start to like discover what's down there and play with yourself and then you have your first orgasm, like everything is kind of like, oh my God, what's happening? Like that's how it felt. But I was like, in my twenties, wow! How old are you now? If you don't Forty. Mind. Oh wow! Mm-hmm. Wow! So you've lived with this for a while. Yeah. Nice. Mm-hmm. And when you were younger, that's when you knew. I yeah. think most people, when they're younger, realize that's what it seems like. That they're just this isn't comfortable for me right now. This isn't who I am. And so then it happens. Yeah, I knew at a very young age, but like we didn't really have the words for it. Like, I didn't even know the word trans until I came to um, California, to Los Angeles. And it was different back then, too. mm -hmm. It wasn't as accepting. You couldn't say it and be it. Now it's very open. And everybody says it like, no problem. Like, you know. Yeah. And it's more, it's everywhere. Yeah. Like, you can even travel to to the Midwest and you see people. And it's like, before it'd be like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. But it's also mainstream now because of the Republicans and they use it as a a way to create fear um, Mm -hmm. and divide people and also win a vote. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, I think ever since like Trump came into office or started politics, it was really like, whoa, it was like, all you heard about was trans. Like, even now I like look at my TikTok and I get up, I follow a lot of different political news outlets and stuff. And it's always something about trans. And then you look at the comments and it's like, just so negative. Like I was just telling my manager, I'm like, I'm being, I've been feeling very overwhelmed lately. Mm -hmm. And it's because I'm constantly bombarded by like, my rights are on the line. Mm -hmm. People don't understand that. Um, They think it's, like, I don't know. It's just when someone's like, oh, pro Trump, like, did it? Like, it's so personal for yeah. me because we have such a chance of losing our yeah. rights. And I don't know. It's just such a scary time. People like with, with, with me, like growing up, like the only word I knew was midget. Like, that's like what they called us. Even though, like, if you look it up, a midget is like just a petite person, like a jock mm-hmm. or a jockey, like rides a horse. Like, they're just smaller, petite. We're dwarves, but we, I always just got called midget. So that's all I knew. And then now there's all these different words for little people, short kings and, 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 and other things. But I always kind of, uh, I wonder with like the trans cause a long time ago, that wasn't the word transvestites. 
mm-hmm. transvestite. And and is that is, is that the derogatory word for a trans person? Yeah. Okay. I I I, I had no idea. I just kind of knew that from mm-hmm. back in the day. That's what trans people were called. So. Yeah, yeah, and there are some trans people who still use it, you know, just like how you're comfortable using certain yeah. words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You no, know. That, I've heard I've heard it like that. Mm-hmm. So I, um, I I was like, but then if someone else says it, it's kind of like, oh, like, you know, unless they're explaining something or something that they heard or. Yeah, you know. exactly. But, it's like okay, the word I, I wasn't too. sure what, what, what the word was. Okay, mm-hmm. now I know. Yeah, it's okay. transvestite and tranny. It's like tranny. something that people should not say unless you are trans. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. I, um... What else was I going to ask? Oh, yeah. Like, how do you feel about, like, like when you're writing jokes and stuff, like, with mm-hmm. the microaggression going on in your head, like, is it different? Because, I mean, a joke, I mean, if it's a good joke, it's whether it's got microaggression in it or not, I think if it's smart, it kind of is funny. But, like, yeah. I mean, with you and writing a book about it, how how's that how's that work? I know. This book is a serious topic, and I wrote this when I was, like, very full on being an activist. And I think like when you're a minority, you're somewhat always an activist because just existing can be political. And, you know, um, I feel like I'm constantly educating people. And I think any, any time you're always educating people, people have questions, you know, when they see you, they're gonna be like, what's going on? Like, can you tell me this? Or, um, but yeah, I definitely, I don't know. I just, I feel like I stumbled into, comedy like by accident because I sold a TV show and my writing team at the time said you should learn comedy you should take um comedy classes and acting classes because you could possibly be starring in this half hour comedy and so I did and my teacher was like oh my god your timing is great like your point of view like you need to continue doing this so I wrote this in 2020 Mm. and I was, you know, it was such a serious time and also such a, uh, I was, I just wasn't doing comedy. So now I have to balance that. And it is, it is challenging because I could be on a pot, like a comedy podcast and joke about something. And then someone will slide right into my DMs and be like, how dare you fat shame them? And I'm like, it oh, was God. a comedy podcast. <laughs> they told me to make joke. jokes yeah. about it. Like literally, I was at the comedy and store. That's that's a, that's a part. Like it's like a fine line that you're kind of like navigating right now because of yeah of that. I I I feel you know like just just in general like with myself as well. You know. Yeah, but I feel like it's always just a reminder for me to stay in my own lane. It's like yeah. I can make fun of myself all day long, and yeah. people like that, and it's entertaining, and I'm not offending anyone else. Yeah. What do you do for fun besides, you know, spreading the word of transgender or what you do? So what's something Billy likes that's Mm -hmm. outside the realm where you feel very comfortable? Okay. Well, I love writing comedy. Like that's Mm -hmm. something I have so much fun doing. You you, you talked about um, you sold a show. Like what what show? It was a half hour comedy to ABC Disney. um, That is amazing. The Dairy Queen. My wife and I write stuff too. And like it's really hard to even get in the room and like. I know, to sell a pilot, it's insane. Um, But we lost it to the writer's strike, which is like, you know, what happens. Um, But yeah, writing is like something that I love to do. Like I'm uh, working on my second book right now. I just Mm. finished my second book. Yeah. And um, it's- What's your second book? It's a novel. It's fictional. Mm. And, uh, but it's based on my true story in a way. Um, But I loved getting lost in the words and writing and creating- um, I have do you a drink a, like a nice glass of wine and then just get into the writing, or do you not drink at all? I don't drink anymore. Yeah, I don't. No. I don't drink either. So. Yeah, I don't even smoke anymore. I used to have to smoke weed to like be creative, and I don't. Uh, it just like I get into it and it starts flowing, and then I have to get it out. Like I'm addicted to it. Uh, but yeah, I'm writing a couple of screenplays, um, a couple of scripts right now. Like one with Sammy. We're writing a girl stoner movie. We just finished mm. yesterday, actually. Oh, that's nice. great. I know. It took us a year because we are so busy. Final draft? Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. nice. But uh, yeah, I, I try to just be creative as much as I can. And I'm really big into yoga, hot yoga. Uh, that's what I do. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's my big, God. Big yoga guy here. Where do you go? Do, I live in Newport Beach. So oh, okay. I go down there. Um, I've been doing it since 2011. So. Since your back surgery, right? Yep. Yeah. I Me started, and him have both had have like serious back surgeries. Mine more, but like, yeah. 
Yeah. I started because I had sciatica from oh, from yeah. my surgery. Okay. Yeah. So little people have like very compressed back. So eventually, most people get it younger, but we probably lasted longer because of skating and being athletic. But uh, when mine finally happened, I I researched all the doctors. Ponch went first, and he just dove right in, and he had a bad surgery. Well, no, no, but I, I, I heard from a lot of, like, the LP that this is an LP doctor for back, yeah. Dr. Croc. I heard about it, too. And yeah, I and I was like, like, oh, okay, so he's, I just didn't do enough research. Yeah, yeah. and he came back, and it, he couldn't skate after that, and I was like, there's no fucking way I'm going to, yeah. I went to, like, over a dozen doctors till I found this lady. And she's like, I know exactly what you want. It's very light, all this. And I go, we're just going to cut keyholes into your back to open it up, to let the nerves and everything, you know, be good. And I told Poncho, I'm like, go again. And he went to her, but she's like. You know like, what I think is I think that if I would have got my the, the same surgery you got yeah, first, yeah, then my back would have been healed. But the fact that this guy no, did I know. a, a landing neck to me, and then mm -hmm. she was like, it's nine months in. I can't go back yeah. to the same spot. But what I can do is fuse your back there to to mm -hmm. make to strengthen mm -hmm. it, you know, and then you build your core and do whatever you got to do. But uh, it was just, I think it was a little too yeah. late. Like that's kind of, because I, I that with the decompression and the symptoms yeah. that you were having, the numbing of the legs, yeah. the burning, the all yeah. that stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I always felt like I, I, I still feel like there's always like a giant on my shoulder and I'm like trying to like carry him around and shit. I'm like get okay. off of me, dude. Do you <laughs> do HPF? Really HPF hot power fusion? No. Okay, so, well, hot yoga, there's, like, different ways you oh, can. Oh, yeah. But hot power fusion literally is designed, the sequence is designed to expand your spine. So I do hot yoga, which is, it's the all the Bikram moves that you do. Literally, hot power and, fusion yeah. is, like, a knockoff yeah. of that. It's just, like. So I do those yeah. all the time, and I just feel it, like, super stretchy, mm -hmm. especially when you do the one where you're putting your leg out. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you're holding and standing on one. So. It's so good. I, yeah. like, literally like crave it my body yeah. craves it i get it too and if i don't do it i start getting like crazy yeah but my doctor also i had sciatica and she was like such a cool doctor it's one reason why i went vegan and she was like you just need to do hot yoga and she's like trust me do 30 days of hot yoga and you'll feel better and it completely got rid of my sciatica mm. i noticed you went vegan <laughs> and i've done a lot of research on like health and food and blood and all that mm -hmm. and i was wondering do you know your blood type I know I've heard this before too, yeah. and I've gotten the it's, blood type before, but I forget. It's very gnarly because I went vegetarian for seven years and started like gum loss started coming. Like I went hardcore. Gum loss started happening, different things. And I started doing research on blood type O. So blood type O is like the original blood. And what you're supposed to be is carnivore, like very meat heavy. And it just comes from our ancestry and stuff. Yeah. And I think I'm A. A? Or something. Then there is, you might be good. I think A is very plant based and different things like that. It definitely works so, for me. Yeah. Good. No, then you're on the right path. I just, I hear a lot of people do it and then they don't even know the symptoms or what they're doing and stuff. And I'm like, okay, what? Be yeah, prepared. Some, some people do it like, um, and they will like feel so sick and they'll get like weak and yeah. stuff. Like, yeah, you have to definitely no. listen to your body. Um, but I've gone. I've been vegan for 15 years. Nice. You're and, fine. Yeah, it's amazing. Mm. Did, were you ever into any sports growing up? or I was into soccer. Oh, nice. I only did it for like one year, I think. Um, I always had trouble. I just like talked about this recently, but I still, as a 40-year-old woman, have trouble going to public gyms and like being in like the locker room. And like even though I'm in a female locker room and I feel safe, it's just like even the smell – like there, I was bullied so bad as a child, especially in the locker rooms, that it's any sports, like anything like that was just very triggering for me. PTSD? So I, mm -hmm. Totally. Mm. Yeah, so no sports. Like when you say bullied, like like what do you mean? I, I, I got bullied too, but it was like, it was a, a, probably different than, than yeah. yours. Like were they calling you names? Were they like beating on you, st stuffing you in the locker? What was going on? Um, well, people were really, there was some boys that were really uncomfortable with me being feminine. And like, if I looked at them, they thought I was hitting on them. So like, if mm. I walked into the locker room, I had to be very cautious of like, not accidentally looking at someone. Um, and 
a lot of like you know like when you go into the stalls there's like writing on the walls Mm -hmm. you know like carvings and whatever it is most of it was all about me oh shit! like billy sucks dick billy this and it was before i even knew how to suck dick (laughs) (laughs) you're like wow i I could suck dick like (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) shit which definitely i love sucking dick now so they manifested it for Mm -hmm. me it was what i say um but yeah it was it was just like intense and like it's weird i went to my high school reunion And the guys who, like, literally couldn't even look me in the eye were, like, my fans. And every guy was hitting on me. Like, it was intense. I was like, these guys used to bully me. Now they want to fuck me. Now they're my biggest fan. They know so much about my life. I was like, what? Who are you? Like, it was pretty. When when they approached you, like, was there ever any apology? There was one guy who... He came up to me and was like talking to me and being nice to me. And he was like, I like your travels, like everywhere you go. Like he was definitely following me. Mm-hmm. And I was like, dude, I'm like, you were so mean to me. Like you literally wouldn't even look me in the eye. He was like, what? No, I didn't. Like had no idea that he was my bully. Mm. Like did not take any responsibility. And I've heard this from all, m- other people that like a lot of bullies really don't even like remember that they did it. Um, but because of it was our trauma that we were holding on to and the shame, um, we remember it, you know. So, but it was a really nice way of being like, because when I was younger and I did see a lot of the writing on the walls, something that I had to work on. And my I had a therapist at a very young age because I had childhood depression and OCD. Um, and I learned that there was only certain things that I could control. And it was my perception and like how I deal with the problem. And so I would see the writing on the wall and I used to be like so traumatized by it and I would like cry and like I missed a lot of grade school because of it. But then I realized, wait, these people are taking their time out of their day to think about me and write about me. Like I must be something. Mm. Living in their head rent free. Literally. Yep. (laughs) And then years later when I see them at my high school reunion, I'm like, oh, they're like a fan. (laughs) I, uh, I had a high school bully named Spider. Ew. And um, I know he was <laughs> this scary. Latino guy, terrible from tattoos. The 60s or something? No, no, no. He, he, he was something? like he. It was in San Jose. It was like senior senior year. That's and a he, villain. <laughs> and he was like mean to me. Like he he and he was just kind of scary. So no one ever like kind of stuck up for me or any mm-hmm. of that. And I found out later on in life that he's in jail for the rest of his life. So fuck you, yeah. Spider. <laughs> and I don't, I don't want that to bring a smile to my face, mm-hmm. but it kind of does, you know. Yeah. Like I'm like fuck. Like no one should be in, I, and not no one, but like this guy. Like all I know him from is being a dick to me. He never like fucking physically hurt me or anything. But mm-hmm. Jesus, I'm like, he said some of the worst shit ever. Like if he was a stand-up comic, I would be afraid. <laughs> this guy is terrible. Yeah. Well. I guess this, this is kind of mean, but it's a name with spider, like that's kind of predictable. <laughs> He's spending his life in prison. Spider with a Y. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> terrible. Oh, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Fucking terrible person, dude. <laughs> yeah, that is, <clears throat> that's traumatizing. I definitely have had moments where I was bullied. I had this moment, like it was on Halloween. I was riding my bike and this older guy, he was an older kid. Like he was probably like two or three years older than me. But I, he definitely was like, probably a senior in high school when I was like a freshman and he knocked me off my bike and I was like by this bush or whatever. And he was like beating me up, but then kissing me. Like he literally was like, so wanting to kill me, but also wanting to fuck me. This dude sounds like a serial killer murderer. I know. First of all, that's yeah. what I felt too. <laughs> but also like, <laughs> like and it was on Halloween. Like some Ted Bundy <laughs> shit, dude. <laughs> I know. And it was on Halloween. It was so scary. Oh my goodness. Um, but he was, there was something there that like, I could just tell he was like really battling his own demons about being attracted to oh, me and yeah, being attracted probably. to boys. wonder where he is now. Uh, He's somewhere creepy. I know. <laughs> Yeah, literally. Yeah, him and with Spider, Spider are fucking stuck in a <laughs> cell roommates. together. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're fucking each other. Cellmates. <laughs> They're fucking each other. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Have you had like a moment where a young boy came up to you and was like coming to you as like, I know how you feel. This is how I feel. Mm. And 
I want to take the next steps. You're exactly like where, like mm-hmm. your, you, your mindset is where my mindset is. Yeah. Good question. Um, well, I would say what's more common than I've had than that is, I mean, I do have kids reach out to me mm-hmm. and be like, you're my idol. Mm-hmm. Like, but what I've experienced most of the time is teachers and parents will be yeah. very emotional and come up to me and be like, you have literally changed my life. Like you've helped me so much through my own kid's journey being trans. Mm-hmm. And then also teachers being like, I literally talk about you to kids who are struggling with their gender identity. Mm-hmm. Like, so it's cool to know that I b- being visible is paying off mm. in that way. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I, I do like, it's just, it's not as much kids. It's more their parents. Got it. That I get it from. That, or, yeah. That was like, kind of like a, uh, we expi- we when we we had Chaz Bone on a show. He's a mm-hmm. friend. Oh yeah, and um, that was one of the things he was talking about, like dealing with kids that more suicidal because of like the bullying or all the stuff that they've kind of dealt with, and kind of being inspirational to them. Like, was he like an inspiration? Because uh, I know that he was one of the the first to come out openly with being trans Mm -hmm. uh were you familiar with that with that journey or did you follow the Chaz Bono yeah I did I I I, um followed that I think I've met them a couple times um and yeah I mean anytime you see someone trans in the media you know like especially when you're younger it's like um it's nice to see that because you don't feel so alone which I think is why it's so important for me to be visible and it's one reason why I even joined Vanderpump because I didn't even like reality TV. I still don't watch reality TV, but I knew like it was cool to be a mis- to go on a mission and be visible and show that trans people are worthy of jobs because our unemployment rate is so much higher than the general population, mm. and also our suicide rate is so much higher. Um, little, I, th- I feel like little people have a there's like a high suicide rate with uh with little people. Like I, I've heard, I, I like I've had a lot of little people friend that just just killed themselves. Yeah. And it's kind of crazy to kind of, and one of them was like really a close friend of mine, but mm-hmm. the other is like, you kind of just hear about it in the community, like so-and-so. Well, that's what's like so personal and like also just terrifying is like, you know, there's this rumor. I don't know. I My friends are teachers back at home. My girlfriends in Indiana, they're teachers and coaches and stuff now. Um, but there's this rumor that like they the school corporations are now allowing cat litter in the bathrooms because kids identify as cats. Have you heard this? No. <laughs> it's a thing by MAGA. MAGA like started this thing. And like all wow. these teachers come MAGA out. MAGA started it? Really? Like Republicans, MAGA, conspiracy yeah, theories. Yeah, yeah, no. Okay, so the conspiracy theories. But they've come people. out and said like so many teachers is like we've never seen one cat litter box at school. Yeah. Like, what are you guys talking yeah. about? But like even with Trump also saying like you can your kids will go to school and they'll come back a different gender. And I don't know if you saw the TikTok trend where everyone's like I don't have TikTok. Oh okay. I've never signed up. Well, a lot of people I, yeah. are like saying bye to their kid and then they open the door and the door is coming back and the kids all dress like a woman and it's like fake balloons. Like it's a joke because school corporations can't even can't even afford free lunches, let alone paying for someone's yeah. surgery. No, yeah. Like, are you kidding? I wish it was that yeah. easy. I wish I didn't have to pay a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> that is that like is that how much a surgery like that costs a hundred thousand in like, total? Yeah, full? it was probably a little under that, but yeah. Um, but it's just like the this is so hard for like it just makes me so mad when I hear things like that and mm-hmm. people making up lies, mm-hmm. especially on like fake news, fake news, but <laughs> a presidential candidate on a national like stage, like such a platform making these lies up, like it's it's harming my trans community and it's harming the children who are actually going through that. And if I could, you know, have at let's say 15 or 16 have taken um, testosterone blockers and didn't have to experience puberty like I did, it would have really saved me a lot of heartache, depression, trauma. Um, I've said this before, but it's like whenever I started puberty, it was like a monster was growing in my body. Like I hated it. Um, And so I don't, you know, necessarily think that again, the schools are not paying. Why why, why did you hate it? Um, Because I was feminine. I liked my body being feminine. And And as like the, 
the uh, the, and, the puberty and when started you start hitting. Puberty, the, the voice change. The voice changes. Mm. You grow hair, and like most boys who are cis and appreciate their gender and love that, then they're cool with it. They're like, hell yeah, I'm starting puberty. But for me, it was uh, a very dark time, and a lot of trans people go through that, which is why I think it's so important to allow kids to go on blockers if they want to. Obviously, it's up to the parents as well, but um, blockers can be reversed. Like, you can stop taking it, and you can go back to your normal way. It's not major surgeries. What was it like with your parents as far as, like, wanting to do this, and were they Mm -hmm. very supportive of it? My parents are very supportive now. Like, they are, like, my number one fan. They see me as their daughter. But when I was younger, it was very challenging. Uh, My dad, and I write this in my book, Um, you know, my dad would constantly compare me to my brother, um, who was very masculine, very manly. I mean, he's like a roofer. He literally takes after my dad. Um, and so he would always be like, you need to like man up. You need to like get dirty. You need to go fishing. Like, (laughs) and he was doing it to try to protect me, but it was constantly letting me know that I was wrong. Um, and then whenever I did moved to LA my mom said something to me she was like as long as you don't wear dresses or something there was just like a lot of like fear around it you know like they were very scared and I can relate to a lot of parents who have trans kids because the thing that you want the most with your child is you want them to be loved Mm -hmm. and if someone's saying hey I actually feel this way and you're going to go into this community that is being shunned by society and that has struggled so much still in 2024, Mm. I would have fear for my child, you know, but at the same time, you know, I don't know if you guys watched the documentary with um, Harper and Will Ferrell. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So I think one of the most important things that Will Ferrell asked is he's like, Harper, are you happy now? Are you happier? And Uh she said, yes. Uh Like you could tell from the beginning she was. Mm hmm. And, yeah. like, that's what's life-saving is being able to a fully express who you want to be. It just brings so much love and joy to yourself. Did you watch it, Punch? No. I was. It's I was, really good. My, I think especially, my wife watched it. Especially, like, Harper says it was a different road trip because Will was with her. Mm-hmm. But you see Will, his, he gets opened up to this and really you know really feels what it's like because when he's with harper he it's a team so when he walks into doors places they're not only looking at harper that way they're looking at will that way and will feels it and you can tell and you can see you can see this one part i don't want to ruin it for you but there's a part where he go they go into a place together and they're center stage and will is like dude i've been center stage at many places this is the gnarliest feeling I've felt all eyes on me. Mm-hmm. And you can tell it's like, whoa. Like the uncomfortability. The of- uncomfortability is so uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. But Will's like, fuck it. We're here together. Mm-hmm. And like, I'm here with you. And this is how it is. Wow. And he makes Harper feel a lot better. That's good. And, He's very supportive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so supportive all the way. And the best, one of my favorite parts is they get to like, they go from New York to Santa Monica. They're on the beach right like, Fuck it, let's just go back on the road again. Like, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask, like, when you were talking about the bullying, like that's mm-hmm. that 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 you received, um, and with your father kind of trying to protect you, mm-hmm. did you did did were you did you tell like your parents like I'm getting bullied at the in the lockers like really bad, and did you have to change schools or did it go that far or or no did he say man up like yeah like what was uh like it just seems like uh hard like i i i I, every like i didn't really get bullied as much but when i did it was pretty intense and it was but i never told my parents about it you know Mm -hmm. i kind of kept it to myself maybe uh, most people do yeah i I would prefer i think a lot of people kids they carry this on like they carry it with them they don't want to tell because they're embarrassed in a way Mm which is one reason why kids commit suicide because they don't feel like they can tell anyone and they are afraid to tell people. Um, I didn't have that privilege of keeping it to myself because my brother, he was a year younger than me and my brother would literally tell my parents like at dinner, 
we would sit at dinner and he'd be like, so they said Billy's shaving his legs today and like Billy does this and Billy does that. And it would be so uncomfortable because the conversation was always about my gender, always about my sexuality. So I learned and I actually write this in my book as well. I had this really bad habit where I experienced a lot of microaggressions in my dating life because I would eat really fast and I ate really fast because it was a form of protecting myself because when I was younger, I had to finish my plate, but I didn't want to sit there and listen to them talk about me. And I also, I was so afraid that, oh my God, he's going to bring this up. He's going to bring that up. And so like I would eat really fast and then go up to my bedroom. Mm -hmm. um, and that habit, you know, obviously I don't do that anymore, but I had to count and like learn how to eat slower because it was like, you know, sometimes we have our defense mechanisms as a child, but then it's not good as mm -hmm. an adult and we have to unlearn them. Um, but yeah, my parents knew because of my brother and I don't even have a relationship with my brother. Mm, I was that, always okay. so mad at him. I thought you were going to go like a different route and say that. And my brother would see this happen and he would just start going ballistic on people like just and I, I didn't. Yeah, that's pretty gnarly. He Billy. says he, my brother's point of view is um, that he did protect me. I'm sure a lot of conversations that I didn't get to see um, and I wasn't in the room or whatever. They were he was probably defending yeah. me. But when it came to you in the house mm. and we were brothers and we were with my family. Siblings. Siblings. It mm. was very toxic. <laughs> so you never had someone like in high school or middle school, like me and him talked about it with our other buddy, Lee. Like we always, I I, I, I went to a bunch of different schools because of my dad's job. He was, uh, but um, so like the first couple weeks of school would always be kind of gnarly, but. I would like, for some reason, I always attracted like the bigger guy that would always mm -hmm. kind of stick up for me and like, just not let any protect me. And that was just kind of, they just did it. You know, I never asked for it or any of that. They just kind of were by my side. Like I was like, mm -hmm. and, um, did you have someone like that for you? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, um, in school? Yeah. So I had a, uh, I had a cousin who was actually suspended for beating someone up because of me. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, which also, you don't want the whole school knowing. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, he beat someone up because they called me a faggot for the fifth time. Like, you know, it's just like you don't want that to be a thing. Um, but, yeah, people have done that. I've also had, like, really amazing just good friends that, like, guy friends who have been a protector um, in my life, which is what my second book I've been writing about. is. It's, like, parts of that story of having someone who's – you know, always loved you no matter what, even if you are like the different weird kid. Mm. Yeah. Not to change the subject, but to make it fun. You <laughs> talked about, <laughs> you talked about transgender people, especially having a rough time getting jobs. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we like to talk about on this podcast is one of the most interesting, worst or something jobs you could have even had it for a day or whatever and been like, this is not me. But some job you've had where people don't know and you're like, this is how I felt about it, where people are like, I can't believe Billy did that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> is there anything that you've had that you you always look back on? Like, even if it was like when you were a teenager, everybody had like a paper route or something or worked at a fast food, you know? Yeah. Okay. Well, two things come to mind, but I was a lifeguard. Mm. Like at, at the um, beach or at a po At a public lake. Oh, at a lake, lake. Okay. Um, when I was 16. Okay. Um, so I definitely, uh, yeah, that was like a very interesting job because I was young and I was like drinking a lot. And so mm. I would fall asleep and hope that no one would drown. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> but you have to be a good swimmer to become a lifeguard. Like I have a good swimmer, yeah. Yeah, okay. So you went through the whole training to be a lifeguard yes and then you're like fuck it i'm just gonna party and if someone if someone else can't swim <laughs> shoot for them well because like i was the only lifeguard on the lake and i literally would wake up and be like oh my god did someone drown like i was so afraid because because if you're drinking all night and then you're in the sun for eight hours oh like, yeah oh my god like i was always so tired so back when you were drinking what was your what was your drink in high school uh, like a, as time. a lifeguard, oh. as a lifeguard, I would go. Oh my god! Day. In high school, we were drinking Bacardi One Fifty One. Okay, 
like anything to get us like as mm-hmm. wasted. Also, I love beer. Yeah. I'm a beer drinker. Um, beer and wine is what I normally drink. I don't really drink anything hard like her anymore. Yeah. It's been years. Um, but and this is like not to be in in a dark place or no, anything like dark. that. No dark. No dark. Yeah. <laughs> no, because I actually enjoyed it. But I probably one of the craziest jobs was doing sex work because of I couldn't get a job when I first transitioned. Um, when you start hormones and stuff, like it was really hard for me to get a job in LA because mm-hmm. like, I've, I've been a server most of my life. I started mm-hmm. when I was 15 and I was a server trainer in Indiana. I was a server trainer when I was in college. Like I was a really good server and I still, it's like something that I love that I did because I love being of service in every way. Um, but when I came out to LA, you had to have like a headshot with your resume. You had to be like a model <laughs> to be yeah, an actor. Like you know. like I see the bartending school, like everyone's got a headshot up to like be you, a bartender. Yeah, to be a <laughs> server, you literally have to be like a model or an actor yeah. here. And I'm like, what? So my resume, people would be like, oh, like this person's great. And then when I go in for the interview, they're like, what the fuck is this person? Is it a boy? Is it a girl? Like society couldn't put me in a box at that time. I wasn't mm-hmm. sister swimming. Mm-hmm. Um so I could not get a job. I struggled so bad. And then so at the same time, I had guys like attracted to me like as a fetish or like, mm-hmm. you know, like a secret little fantasy because I was presenting somewhat female and I still had a penis. Um, so I went where the money was and got it. I had um, I built a few really good clients that would come in town. I'd be in like a fancy hotel and. They would like have champagne like on ice and um, they would leave a really nice chunk of cash on the table. Mm -hmm. And it was something that I also created my own fantasy to survive it, Mm -hmm. like not even survive it because they I was blessed enough to have been treated with respect to enjoy it, to enjoy it. But you're still in scary situations, mm-hmm. you know, you still like have to enter a room that you don't know this person. Like there's always the first time. Um, and there's also times where you're just like, you know, you don't feel like going to your job. Yeah. You're like having a That's bad day. Everybody. That's everybody. That's everybody. Yeah. But then you have to go and entertain this guy and mm. you have to like, create this fantasy for him because that's what you're getting paid to do. So you had you had <laughs> some you had a couple of regulars. You end up getting regular. Yeah, yeah. If you I, perform, I, I'm well. sure that's probably makes you feel a little safer. It's not new. Totally new, like where you don't safe, know, yeah. like what the hell is about to happen. Yeah, and any new client, I would like have a routine of like, you know, like I would have a knife like hidden in my um, sleeve, and then I would walk into the room, and I basically did like what sec- any security would do. I would clear the room. Yeah. So I would look in every mm-hmm. corner behind the doors in the closets just to make sure that no one would come out and drug me or like you know. Um, and you also have to be like, you take little sips of your drink, very little at first. Mm-hmm. You pour your own drink. Mm-hmm. Like, you make sure the bottle's not open. Like, there are certain things you just have to do to protect yourself. Mm. I think which every woman needs to do anyways. In, Anywhere in, you're at yeah, now. Anywhere, yeah, yeah, totally. So. Um, but, yeah, so it was, and I would fantasize. I would pretend like he was my husband. I would have all kinds of thoughts in my head. Like, I'm really good at tapping into my imaginary circumstance. Um, so, yeah, I would have crazy fantasies in my head Mm -hmm. that would really play well with what he expected and what he needed. Mm -hmm. I'm also a pleaser. So that worked out really well. Mm -hmm. Um, But -hmm. yeah, it was, that was probably one of the most interesting jobs. Do you have any uh, celebrity crushes? No, I'm not big on like, and it's weird. I don't get starstruck. I'm not big on like celebrity crushes. I've, or like anybody that made you like kind of feel different when you when you're like oh, that's like a guy I would spend the rest of my life with like that kind of style person not not necessarily as celebrity but like like a a, a man that you kind of yeah crush over. There are people that I've um, so I've been in the industry for a long time and I've had very um, successful friends throughout yeah. my life, and because of their fame and success, I've met people that are also famous mm. and they have made me feel a certain type of way, like yeah. very good. Yeah. Um, and uh, I will never disclose who they are, but like if I was ever going to say they're a celebrity crush, like I've had my chances, like I've had my ways, yeah. but again, it was also like um, discreet because they are famous and I am trans. Um, 
that's crazy how that works, man. Like how like that's that that that's discretion is like so important with, with things like yeah. that because this was years oh. ago. Like I don't really do that now. Yeah. Like I'm very. Do you now, feel like it's really okay. it's the same now? Like as far as years ago with like the discretion with like with the male or and and, and you. No, no. I mean, so- there's still shame. There's still guys that are like confused and you know like want to date me and like me and um then they find out that i'm trans and they're like oh shit i can't do this <laughs> like or i'm like they immediately think that someone's gonna think they're gay and like but it doesn't make sense because i'm full female so yeah but yeah guys i uh i was reading in your book that uh that you're looking into adopting Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, what are the challenges with that? Like, are, are you have you found the kid or my wife and I talked about adopting as well? Yeah. Because there's so many kids out there that that like you know don't have homes that are yeah kind of forgotten about. But uh, what if, what if, what if we haven't really like dug deep into it? Like we're not sure yet. Mm-hmm. But what what are the some of the challenges that you're facing with like adopting a, a child and stuff? Well, there are so many ways you can go about having a child, <clears throat> but. In 2020, when I was writing this book, which is one reason why I mention it in there, um, I got certified by, uh, there's an amazing um, organization called Extraordinary Families that's in LA. It's an adoption agency. And they work with the state and the city to basically foster to adopt. So I went through this whole program. It was three months long and I got passed and approved to adopt or whatever. And... I um, realized that I could never have a child that could possibly be taken away from me. Like, because you do go through a period oh, where, like, when you foster to adopt, you have a year that anyone, family members mm-hmm. can can come. Because mm-hmm. the whole point of fostering oh, to adopt and, uh, is to reunite child. with the original mm-hmm. family. Um, but I, so I was like, I can't go this way. There's no way I could do that. And then I had, like, a friend... I've had friends be like, oh, like, I'll give you my egg. I'll give you my sperm, you know. And um, so I've had friendships where they were like, let's have a kid together, you know. And, like, we would just be, like, parents, partners. and um, Or they would just help me have a child. And then I realized I don't want to just – there's so many kids out there that need a home. I don't want to create a child. I would like to adopt. So the best way that I'm going to do it is I'm going to – be paired with through an agency and attorneys with a mother who is pregnant and who is actually wanting to sign over the baby to Mm -hmm. me. And I will be there the first day it's born and hold the baby and take it home. So that's the way that I want to go. I've had to figure out the right way. Um, But currently because of my work and so many things are happening, I'm not necessarily ready to do that. Um, But I do plan on doing it in the next couple of years when I get a little chance to, yeah. Playing it out. Yeah. You want to be there for the child. Yeah, exactly. And my, I'm building my career in a way where I'll be able to bring my child everywhere I go. Perfect. Um, and then also I'm going to need help like with nannies and stuff like that. So yeah. financially I'm going to need to be in a place. And if I'm doing it by myself, then yeah. That was something like that is the idea to, to, hi, to, to find a, a husband as well. Um, I think it would be great to have a husband. Yes. Uh, I've I've been single for like a year now mm-hmm. and I've been just so focused on my work. Um, my last relationship took a lot out of me and I sacrificed a lot and um, it feels really good, really empowering and there's a sense of freedom for me to be alone right now. Um, I'm a, t- a anxious attachment style. I don't know if you've heard of that. What attachment that? style. So there's like secure, avoidant, anxious or like the main three ones. Um, if you usually grow up in trauma and your parents are anxious or there's like a lot of just crazy energy in your household, you can be somewhat anxious when you're attached to someone. So the second I get a boyfriend, it's like, is he going to text me back? Is he this? I need to do this for him. I'm thinking about him. I walk into a store and all of a sudden I like want to buy him underwear. It's like my whole world because of my attachment is, and I sacrifice so much and I get rid of so much of my, I like let go of myself in a way. Um, so through therapy and reading and learning about that, Mm -hmm. um, it's for people who are anxious attachment when they do in the relationship, 
it's very hard for them. But then there's this sense of freedom because you're not attached to something that you're like so focused on. Uh, so I'm very happy with mm. where I'm at right now. And I try to date, like I get hit on a lot of the clubs, like guys, comedians will want to yeah. take me out or whatever. And it's like, I say, yes, I give them my number and then I don't respond to them. Mm. I'm the worst <laughs> at texting. <laughs> Like, my best friends are like, can you text me back? Let alone, like, some dude. And I don't save numbers, so I always end up forgetting. Like, it's just bad. Just live you. Be you. Yeah. When it happens, it happens. Yeah. Like, don't worry about it. Yeah. Is there, is there, um, hmm. with, the, with the procedure that you had done, the surgery and stuff, you had it done, you said, 20 years ago? I had the... I started hormones like 20 okay. years ago. I medically transitioned, which means the, all the surgeries okay. in 2012. Okay. Now, is there like side effects? Is there things that go wrong or like that you deal with that like where you have to go back and ask questions about like certain mm -hmm. things like pains that you're getting or? There's no, there's nothing now. Um, I do have to, uh, like I did have a more of a he longer healing journey than most people um, because he made me like deeper, like made my vagina deeper. So like the deeper you are, like the longer it takes to heal. Uh, so there was like scar tissue and like it just was like it felt like a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a little scary because it did take me like six months to really heal. And I went from being so active, like hiking and like working out every day to being on a bed and a couch for six months, which is why I got sciatica. So it was, that was um, challenging. And then also if I'm not having intercourse, which I haven't in like a year, uh, my vagina can get somewhat tight. Um, so when I do date, I just like the guy needs to be patient so I can um, dilate in that way. Uh, is it kind of like, um, does it matter like if like, when the vagina gets that tight, is it, um, shit. like if, like, do you kind of like kind of gauge that with the guy? Like with like, what if he has an enormous penis? Mm -hmm. Like it is, that could be probably scary. Right. Or I don't know. Yeah. I, I, yeah. yeah. I have a joke where I date, um, I, <laughs> I date... haven't heard this, but say it please. <laughs> no, I don't I'm so dumb. I'm just like, uh, <laughs> that we've noticed. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I literally like. There he goes again. <laughs> yeah, there he goes. <laughs> That's my bud. <laughs> just stating the obvious. Um, Shut up. <laughs> no, I just like randomly say in my set, I'm like, so I only date guys with small dicks. Mm. And then I'm like, a couple of them are here tonight. Oh, and God. Like, nice. people, like, Every die guy's like, oh, <laughs> no. And I have guys who, like, who like, are like, have crushes on me. You know, like, this is couple guys from my acting class that would like always want to be around me and like hang out and like I don't know why but I, I attract a lot of younger guys like they always want to hang out and like have sex with me um but so then I would do my show and then afterwards they'd be like I gotta run out the door because people are gonna think it's me <laughs> and I'm like I, it's just a joke like yeah. I don't literally just yeah. date guys with small dicks yeah yeah it's easier for yeah. sure but I've dated guys with large dicks and it just takes more time yeah mm -hmm. and they're patient and they're yeah, if they're not patient, then um, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. No, no. Well, yeah. hmm. ending on big penises. Yeah, we're, we're ending on great <laughs> yeah, way to end on we're, it. We're ending yeah. on small penises. <laughs> really? You want to? You want to have a penis contest? We have a penis contest every time we're doing this. So like, it's always a, it's always a penis contest. <laughs> Me and him used to kind of be rivals through skateboarding because we're the only two little people skateboarders. So, like, it was always kind of a rivalry between us, but now we're buds. But, like, it's just funny. So, we, there's always that little kind of tension there between right, us. Right. That's crazy. I think, so. Yeah. It's <laughs> fucking crazy. And Next still to this day, though, we were only the, we're the only two little people professional skateboarders professional. Yeah. ever. There's, like, guys and there's been are, a lot and they're good, but they, they just don't make it to the next level. Yeah. Damn. I'm well, yeah. proud of you guys. Thank it's you. kind of crazy mm -hmm. to say that. Well, proud of you. Yeah. Thank you. Know what you. I mean? Hopefully, this opens up. Maybe there's somebody that watches our show and goes, "Oh my god!" and finds you and changes. Yeah, their life. I That'd hope so. Cool. And the whole point of writing my book um, was so people can read it and feel seen and yeah. heard and understood, and then yeah. also so people can 
educate themselves. Yeah. It's such a great coffee table book, you know, because yeah. you can pick it up and read like two pages and, and learn something. It's not like you have to read it from the it beginning very, to the end. It was a very easy read as far as like, you know. That was my goal. Yeah. yeah. You got to oh. go more than 25 pages though. Yeah, no, it's 90 pages. So <laughs> I definitely got to. Yeah, but you can take your time. Like yeah. I, literally it's the best coffee table book or the best gift. But thank you guys so much for having me. Thank I you. appreciate it. Was, it. It, was it was really, really good. good to have you. Wanna, is there anything you want to plug or any? Um, yeah, just going to say my book, you can purchase anywhere. Um, books are sold why are you so sensitive and then um, you can find me at it's me Billy Lee and I'll be doing shows in New York for the next month nice um, but yeah thanks yeah. for having me cool thanks Woo. for coming out thank you Billy Lee for coming on our show yeah. that has been the Little Revolution podcast thank you guys for tuning in Poncho Weeman Billy Lee 